Well, thank you very much. I've <laughs> never received such a greeting in my life before. <laughs> yeah, but I would r like to remind him. <laughs> because I've seen Ron introduce people before. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the ATPAs. I'm, I've studied it uh, for more than 30 years now. And uh, i just remind you of a few basic facts. So what you can see there uh, is a representation of the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And sugars, as you know, are broken down to pyruvate by glycolysis. And the pyruvate uh, is transported into mitochondria by a mechanism, strangely enough, we still don't know. Um, there it encounters uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase producing acetal-CoA and importantly, generating reducing equivalents. Uh, the acetal-CoA feeds into the Krebs cycle, and out of that uh, come more reducing equivalents. Um, fat, fats in food um, are transported into mitochondria by attaching them, the acyl groups, uh, to coenzyme A, um, and uh, then the acyl group is transferred to carnitine, and it's actually acyl-carnitine uh, that's transferred into the mitochondria uh, in exchange for internal uh, carnitine. Uh, then, uh, then the acyl groups are transferred back onto coenzyme A inside the mitochondrion and they enter the beta oxidation pathway. And again, without going through the details, more reducing equivalents are produced. And so uh, what has happened is that uh, energy in fats and sugars have been turned uh, into redox energy uh, which can then be fed into the electron transport chain and provide the energy for generating uh, the proton motive force, as Peter Mitchell uh, uh, called it, uh, across uh, the, 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 the inner membrane uh, of mitochondria. Um, and once this, and I'll explain a little bit more uh, how the proton motive force is generated in a moment, uh, but once it has been generated, then the ATPase that I'm clearly going to be talking about uses the energy stored in the proton motive force uh, to generate uh, adenosine triphosphate from ADP uh, and phosphate. And uh, so here's a, um, <coughs> a simplified uh, version uh, of that, that picture uh, depicting the main players in the respiratory chain in mitochondria. So the, the reducing equivalents feed into the electron ch transport chain via uh, complex one. This structure here is actually the structure of a bacterial homologue. Um, you, you can see it's, it's really an enormous uh, structure. This extrinsic arm which protrudes into the matrix of the mitochondrion is about 100 angstroms uh, high uh, and <laughs> consists in the bacterial case uh, of about seven different polypeptides. Uh, in man, there are, there are many more, and actually this complex uh, contains 45 uh, 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 proteins uh, in, my, in mammalian mitochondria, and it has a mass of about a megadalton. Um, that's still a rather challenging uh, uh, project, and so the bacterial homologue, which is simpler, has been solved first by my colleague uh, Leonid Sazanov. Uh, the, the extrinsic arm, and I'll explain in a moment what it does, is attached to, to a membrane arm. Uh, this contains more than 80 transmembrane uh, alpha helices, and it, uh, you'll see in a moment uh, the, the dimensions of it. And it's, it's here that somehow uh, re the redox energy, which is supplied at this point here, uh, is, uh, is used to translocate uh, protons uh, th uh, through the membrane. Um, so this is the first point in which, at which redox energy is converted into proton motive force by displacement of protons from the inside uh, to the outside. Um, the, the, the protons are actually transferred onto, co onto coenzyme Q, uh, which when reduced uh, equilibrates in, into, in, into the Q pool uh, in the membrane here. Uh, th this enzyme here is succinate dehydrogenase, one of the enzymes in the Krebs cycle. It does, it, it does not uh, translocate uh, protons, it's not electrogenic, uh, but, but it does reduce uh, coenzyme Q and so it contributes to the Q pool. So the, the reduced Q then comes to the next 
complex in, the, in this uh, uh, chain. This is cytochrome BC1, um, or <coughs> which is a, a complex uh, that you can see that it's dimeric, and each, each part of it contains 11 uh, polypeptide chains. And without going into the details of it, and we do understand the details of this particular enzyme in contrast to this one, uh, more redox energy uh, is converted into proton motive force, more protons are ejected. Um, oxidized cytochrome C binds uh, it, it, in this region here. The electrons transfer uh, to cytochrome C, which when reduced, loses its affinity and transfers to the terminal oxidase, cytochrome C oxidase, which is a, another very complicated enzyme. Uh, you can see again that it's dimeric and each part contains 13 uh, polypeptide chains. The mechanism of this enzyme uh, is quite well understood, uh, but, uh, but only partially so. It's here that uh, oxygen uh, is reduced to water, so 95% of the oxygen we breathe in, we breathe in uh, is reduced to water uh, at this point. And coupled to these events, uh, 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 more protons are ejected uh, fr uh, uh, from the, the, the matrix of the mitochondrion to contribute uh, to the proton motive force. So in, in this enzyme, uh, two kinds of protons uh, are consumed, the chemical protons that are reducing oxygen to water, and then the, the protons, the vectorial protons that are uh, that translocated uh, through the membrane. So in brief, this is how proton motive force is generated from redox energy provided uh, uh, in the form of foods. And here is the ATPase that I'm, I'm going to discuss. And the, the question, uh, when I started to work on this enzyme, which is still unresolved in detail, but is resolved in principle, is how is the proton motive force coupled uh, to, the, to the synthesis of ATP from ADP and, and, and phosphate? And I'm going to describe the details of this enzyme uh, in a moment. So the ATP is produced in the matrix of the mitochondrion, and if it's going to be useful uh, to, to the cell as, as a form of of energy and fuel, it has to be translocated through this membrane, and this is accomplished by uh, a transport protein called ADP ATP translocase. In other words, it exchanges external ADP for internal uh, ATP and s swaps them around. Um, there's another transport protein which is related to it in structure uh, called the phosphate carrier, and, and what that does is to bring back the phosphate that's been released uh, when ATP has been hydrolyzed, when it's given up its energy uh, to, to some process or other. So there's a cycle uh, in mitochondria of ATP being generated into the matrix and supplied as fuel to the cell, and the spent products uh, being brought back into the mitochondria to be resynthesized. And since we know we, uh, how much oxygen we each breathe in per day, we can actually calculate how much uh, ATP each of us makes, and it's in the order of 50 to 60 kilograms per day, uh, the equivalent uh, the, to, to our body weight. I just wanted to say a little bit more about Complex One because this is such a fantastic achievement that Sazanov uh, has, uh, 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 has reached. Uh, so the, the, the extrinsic uh, part of, of Complex One here uh, is constituted as, as follows. The, NADH binding site is distal from, from the membrane here, and electrons are transferred one at, one at a time uh, to a flavine mononucleotide molecule, which is in this region here. And thence they have to be uh, carried uh, uh, 100 angstroms down to, to the membrane domain here where the quin quinone uh, is, is bound. The, it's not known exactly where the quinone binds uh, yet in this, in this structure. And the, the, the FMN binding site is linked to the quinone by a series of six or seven iron sulfur clusters which form a kind of wire that simply conduct the protons by quantum electron tunneling uh, down to this site here. Um, and then what happens next uh, isn't known, but there are, there are clues uh, from this structure that Sazanov uh, has generated because these the two proteins here are clearly related to sodium proton antiporters. And uh, just what that means uh, isn't known. 
But one of the most uh, striking features of, of this structure is that there's a very, uh, there, there are two helices here which sit, uh, as you can see, orthogonal to the trans, transmembrane helices. And Sazanov has suggested uh, that, that, that the, the way this enzyme might work is that by this, uh, these helices moving back and forth uh, uh, like, a, uh, like a piston to, to, to somehow uh, impelled uh, by some events that are, are not known here. And that the, the, this back and forth mo mo movement, uh, rather, like a, uh, rather like a steam engine, somehow does something to these protons that uh, proteins that leads to the translocation of, of protons through the membrane. So this is, uh, 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 something, uh, this is something that's in progress, uh, trying to put flesh and test uh, this idea that Sazanov has uh, uh, proposed. So I want to take a step back to the point when I uh, published my first paper on ATPAs in, in 1981. So at that point, we knew the ultrastructure of, of the ATPAs from electron microscopy that had been carried out 20 years earlier, uh, initially by Fernandez Moran and then by uh, Ephraim Racker. And then uh, Paul uh, Boyer uh, had established many of the features of the binding change mechanism, and he continued to work on that throughout the period that I, I was trying to establish the, the, the structure. And the, the, of course there was, as, as many of you know, uh, a, a beautiful um, a, a coincidence between what Paul was doing using uh, 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 methods to study the mechanism uh, uh, by kinetic methods and what I was doing uh, in structural terms. Um, the, the, the subunit composition of the catalytic part was known, but the, the, the number of, of each of the subunits wasn't. Um, at, at that time, there were almost no sequences. Remember, it was only in 1974 that Sanger produced the first uh, uh, DNA sequence um, of a, a small bacteriophage, Phi X174. And in 1978, the, the, the sequence of mitochondrial DNA, which is 16.5 kilobases, uh, was produced by, by Sanger's group. And the way I got into this field was actually helping to interpret that DNA sequence by identifying the genes by uh, sequencing uh, the, the, the proteins. And uh, again, uh, at, at this uh, juncture, no genes had been cloned. The, the, this first paper that I published was actually the sequence of, of the first genes for a bacterial ATP. As no cDNAs had been cloned. Uh, both sequencing and, uh, and cloning were really uh, technically quite challenging. Uh, at, at, this, uh, at this juncture. And of course, there was no PCR. And, and th th there's a, a very nice history um, of this, uh, th these early events uh, re relating to the ATPAs, which is actually uh, centered on Ephraim Racker, which has just been published um, by Gottfried Schatz, and it's called uh, Feuerzucker. So it, it's published in German. Uh, but if, if you can manage it, it's actually a very interesting read. <coughs> 